So next we have, uh, are you a professor or a doctor? Ron, uh, I'm Ronan. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Um, Ronan Canavan is consultant endocrinologist in St. Vincent University Hospital since approximately 2007. He's also, and this is the first time I met him, the former clinical lead in the National Clinical Program for Diabetes. And he was actually involved in the lead, uh, uh, in the camp as lead when we were campaigning to have a national podiatry program and you were involved in the establishment of the retina screening program which is the number one success in diabetes care in Ireland today and Ronan is actually going to talk about the very access to the insulin pumps or hopefully something around that area. Okay. Thank you very much, Grania. Um, sorry for that flippant answer. I do have a title of Associate Clinical Professor uh, as such. I think they're called Ask Profs. Um, so I try not to use that term. So, um, uh, so, just to, so uh, it's obviously um, it's a great privilege to be here and um, I'm delighted that Shane and Grania asked me to uh, come and present to you today. Uh, and yeah, it, it is a, a big privilege. There's a lot happening uh, around this time of year as school terms end, people start planning for uh, holidays and things like that, and uh, festivals are on the, on the go. I actually got to go to uh, Spice Girls last night with my, <laughs> uh, with my uh, young daughter and my young son. And um, while it was great to see the girls uh, coming 20 years and all fresh and spangly and things like that, I think I'm really at a more meaningful event uh, here today. <laughs> so, um, uh, again, many thanks to uh, um, uh, Shane and Grania and all the organisers for what is really a great event. And it's really, some, there is something special in this, uh, in this process as such. Um, and maybe I'll hopefully capture a little bit of that by the, by the time I get to it. So Shane, I think he had me written down for a 40 minute um, speech, so very good that he got it down to 20 minutes because it allows me sort of, I'm not going to be uh, waffling on and trying to fill all that 40 minutes. So I think it's Mark Twain that said something about, um, I didn't have time to write you a short letter, so I'm writing you a long letter. <laughs> I'm not going to be waffling, or maybe not, but it's all going to be finished in 15, tw uh, less than 20 minutes anyway. So, um, these are some of the challenges that uh, Shane uh, set me. And I suppose uh, it has me, we've all been thinking, I suppose, this area is uh, uh, part of diabetes and technology has been changing. And I, when I've been talking about this to my colleagues and professionals and giving lectures um, and to any patient groups and things like that, I suppose um, I do think we're going through a, a time of disruptive uh, innovation and in fairness I was always I'm thinking of a time when essentially uh, when um, this small white flash device uh, has come out and um, before a year it's it's been here a year in terms of uh, in Ireland and was out in England for a year before that and things like that and but the striking thing was that within pediatric clinics a year before it was ever available in Ireland a third of parents had gone and got this from another country and brought it in so it kind of told me that something was happening there um, and um, and there was uh, I'd seen presentations on Night Scout and we'd heard about looping and things like that uh, and essentially 18 uh, months ago, Shane walks into my office and says, uh, you know that thing with the, the pump, the thing that connects, the computer that connects it to, um, I want to go and build one. So my response, <laughs> oh, okay, Shane. Um, <laughs> What is, the, uh, what is uh, so lots of questions were coming flowing out there, and I suppose um, as all this thing, uh, as one thing about disruptive, I think as lots of things are changing, and we're trying to keep up with uh, how quick it's changing and and uh, understanding it as such, um, we're also somewhat distracted a little bit about uh, the process that's happening. So um, I suppose it was an uncomfortable situation a little bit. And um, I'm not the leading technologist, diabetes technologist in Ireland. Uh, there are a, a couple uh, more of those um, uh, available in, in Ireland as such. 
I do have a good understanding of how a pump works, how a, a glucose, uh, continuous glucose monitor works, the various options available, how to get it as such, and um, I am up to date with where I should be in terms of education. I go to Diabetes Technology Network uh, meetings, I was at one last week in the UK and things like that, So, and people who go to that are in the top quartile, top 10% of, of, um, of, cl of clinics um, uh, who, who have uh, some expertise uh, in this area. I suppose what I have is, though, as a bit more mature, is a bit more perspective than all these young book um, endocrinologists coming up who are going off and doing a year of fellowship and such. And um, what is happening, as much as all this technology is happening, what also is happening is there's a whole communication going on. And I must say, that, that's the aspect that I continue to get distracted by and go off. I'm never off Twitter, um, and uh, it's a good educational source for, uh, for doctors and things. That it was mentioned at the, at the Diabetes Technology Network that it could be used for continuous med medical education to keep up with your Twitter feed uh, around all the community that's happening in this area. So, um, of things that have happened uh, to me in the last few years, there is probably one or two key events that have happened over the last three or four years to me. One of them was actually, uh, so some of those are in professional, some of those in personal, some of those are in social. One of the um, professional ones was going on a, a, a diabetes counselling course, and I suppose this is how we talk to our patients uh, with diabetes and what we, um, uh, well, what way should we, we talk to them and how do we truly get patients um, uh, interests, how do we get how do we do what patients want us to do, I suppose and it's where we've been trying to get to over a while and when I went on this course I didn't suddenly change my activity but it did sort of clarify within a few aspects of this of um, what I thought a doctor had been trained to do and essentially traditionally the model is you've got something, you, uh, you're missing it, I can provide it for you, here you go, do, you go and use it the way I tell you to use it. So we're doctors, the, the, the diabetes teams, the nurses and dietitians are the fixers as such. And clearly that's not anything I've actually been doing for, for years anyway. So when it was explained to me that actually what, what our role is is that we're the facilitators um, and what we're trying to do is get to a healthy situation is where we uh, listen to our patients um, and we try and get them access and get them to a place that, where they can have their best life with diabetes, I suppose, is what we're doing. And that involves uh, being in a place where we have this, uh, this state of genuine uh, positive regard. And as I say, I don't think I was given that when I left this course, but certainly it sh my, my, my thinking shifted a bit and I saw uh, my care as such to a different perspective. Um, so even though I have 23 years of diabetes behind, behind me, I'm so, certainly not finished learning and uh, I have lots of uh, things to, to learn as we go along. So, with regards to um, how uh, uh, the healthcare professional, how the teams are viewing this, we're a bit like that frightened dog there a bit uh, when it comes out. Um, but um, we don't have any data for Ireland, so that is where we're at a, a, a bit of a disadvantage in terms of the looping uh, as, aspect of things. We're really short on what to do about that. So there have been surveys done in the UK, and there's a, it's an association of diabetologists, association of British uh, clinical diabetologists, and they've done a survey asking how many FD people might be looping or are looping in your, in your clinic that you know about. And uh, their, their uh, response to that is that there are a couple of clinics in the UK where up to 20 patients are looping and they expect that number to increase 10, 20 over the next uh, year or two. Um, but there are uh, lots of clinics um, widespread that have one or two people looping. So essentially, I, uh, that makes me immediately question uh, where are those patients in my clinic as such? And are there people that um, we're not having conversations with who... Um, who are looping or thinking about looping. I suppose the positive thing from the survey was in terms of um, three quarters, uh, uh, two thirds of the healthcare professionals being asked in these clinics were very much uh, open to going along with this whole process and, being, um, and going on the journey I suppose the people are undertaking at the moment. Um, there was a point made in terms of that there was a third or a quarter who really are either don't know what to do or don't want to continue on that. 
and um, certainly one of the speakers was happy to say in terms of people have to be respected in that setting in terms of that um, because I think they may have questions, I think questions have to be asked um, and I think we don't have the answers there's whole uh, areas of legal and ethical issues that we haven't worked through that hasn't been tested out and I think it's good to ask those questions I think there are um, what, the, the term yet yeah, known there are known unknowns that we can work through um, and there's always unknown unknowns and I suppose to keep the momentum going forward is what you don't want is uh, cases of regret uh, in there there will be bumps along the way there will be issues uh, with regards to this process but um, uh, the issue it's, it's clearly got momentum with it uh, as, as here today uh, in relation to the, this, this is uh, clearly the future um, uh, with regards to uh, diabetes technology so legal and ethical well legal hasn't been tested I'm not aware of any, <coughs> any areas where this has come up it will come up at some stage and that has to be taken under account I, do, I will have to say you know um, pa patients have taken on the responsibility they're responsible for what they do and things like that I think that's a reasonable statement to do there and that covers to a certain extent. I don't think that necessarily that has to be tested out legally as well where that comes because ultimately um, the question will come back is when so somebody else who's involved in that process, uh, a partner or a carer and things like that says, well, I didn't know that was happening or what in relation to that and that will um, draw out a legal question and a question that needs to be asked in terms of that. Ethical standing, well, um, and certainly in, uh, in healthcare we have medical ethics uh, but they're relatively limited in terms of telling us where this is. It's all very grey about uh, what we can do. So very much we have to do what we think is best out of our experience and from our perspective in each of our clinics um, uh, such. So, and then again, the, 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 the interesting dynamic is where, this, where we sit with our patients as us and doctors. And I suppose a bit like the frightened dog, patients have come in and taken something off me and I'm, I'm going, what are you doing and where are you going with that? Um, but um, the, the reality is it's an uncomfortable situation. I think if you're doing something in your practice and you're just very comfortable with it, you're probably not doing it to the best that you can. So I think it's good to be in an uncomfortable situation and to start learning from that. Um, and I think that reflects good practice um, of how we develop professionally and how we develop as, as individuals. So I think it's good to be uh, in a slightly uncomfortable situation. So, uh, um, with regards to, I suppose, what sh this, this discussion, um, I do want to cover um, with regards to what might happen, uh, where, where we're going in terms of this. And I believe this question has been asked in terms of how many people are using a DOI app system here at the moment. Can I ask that question? Okay, so we have about five people here. Um, the next question I want to ask is... How many people see themselves using a DIY uh, app system in the next 18 months? And we'll give fair wind. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I was thinking, would five become 15 or things like that? So that's kind of, um, uh, that's a, a wave coming towards us, things like that. And I suppose I need to process that in some way because um, there are um, t um, specific courses in the UK around getting teaching about uh, for healthcare professionals about where, uh, where these systems are going and things like that and can I do it for what might be one patient in my clinic, probably not can I do it for half a dozen patients I really should be scheduling how I'm going to fit that in and, and work with that in my, in my clinic going forward, so thank you very much for that actually um, yeah, I thought I'd finish up with a question many people never put their hands up when they, when they get asked questions like this in, uh, <laughs> kind of a self-fulfilling uh, question there so, um, I think with regards to access, um, accessing technology in Ireland, um, I don't have answers. Uh, there's, um, I, uh, I have uh, thoughts around it, and I'll, uh, I'll give that. Um, and I'm happy to work with anybody where, where access can be improved. Um, so, these are, this is the NHS. So, I don't get too excited, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> They're uh, not ours, no. <laughs> So, um, and yeah, I think when you see that, well, 
up the north, uh, across the border, uh, very uh, close by, then you kind of say, well, why don't we have that? The follow-up question, I know there are people here from Northern Ireland as such, so in terms of the 670G, have people had heard about access of that in Northern Ireland? Recently, I've been offered either the combo 640G or the inside, and that's it. Okay, but not the 670G. I think there's one small person in the Royal who's recently started on the 670G. There was mention of it on either the Facebook group or the Twitter one. Yeah. Might be All right, okay. So, I mean, because the issue is, because it's, you, the issue is about other jurisdictions, when you hear it happening, you kind of, it's very much, oh, they have all of it, or they don't have all of it, but it's good to, to know that that's there. Because I'm not aware of, of anybody in Ireland using that. People have 670s, but not um, with sensors that work and, and such. I don't know if anybody has anything to contradict in terms of that. Communication to Galway from San Diego, who's moved to Galway, I don't know why. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but he's left California and he's brought his technology with him and he's, he's closed with Yeah. But he can't get the supplies for the 670. Yeah, so I think the issue is there's an issue about the company uh, making supplies available in this yeah. jurisdiction, I think is the issue. Yeah. As far as I'm aware, the sensor for the Medtronic um, 670 hasn't been approved by the um, health service yet. So. So uh, I don't know the answer in terms of that, but I suppose it's good in terms of the discussion around people getting because it thinks it takes the first and then the second and then and then when when people know it's there, then uh, everybody uh, can 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 be a potential for it, whether they're su the question being whether they're suitable for it or not. So obviously the the scale is much smaller in terms of Ireland. And um, I suppose it's such a depressing slide. I'm not sure I want to spend too much on it. Um, and um, so we've three options that um, uh, traditionally have been available to us. Obviously, Animas is leaving, and uh, Yips, uh, Yips with Pump uh, is uh, My Life is Coming. Um, linked to sensors, there is the uh, Guardian um, uh, and Medtronic. Uh, is linked to, to the Medtronic systems. Uh, ever since, hasn't been available. The implantable um, uh, continuous glucose monitor isn't available, uh, although we've been asking, can we trial it here? Uh, and not so far. Sorry, the, the Medrum, Medrum pump was approved, but the Medrum consumables haven't been approved because the HSE want additional research papers to show the efficacy of the consumable even though it's working in the NHS at the moment. And that's the patch pump that was to replace the Omnipod for the Irish market. Is, is that your understanding? So it's not my understanding because essentially all I have is a document from the HSE showing me those, these devices. So the, the, um, I think Diabetes Ireland might be able to give you a little bit more accurate information okay. on that because as far as I'm aware, it was this, the CGM is approved on the HSE contract. Metrum can't find a distributor to distribute the consumables, but that information may not be correct. Okay, well, I, I got that from Medrum yeah. last week. Talking to okay, so that. that's probably more accurate okay. than Diabetes Ireland. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, so, with uh, regards to CGMs, there's the CGMs that are linked to pumps and the CGMs that are independent. And um, uh, I suppose what these two um, slides indicate is what your clinic knows about, what your clinic can access, um, and again, uh, quite limited in terms of uh, that. Um, with regards to the flash glucose uh, monitor, um, that um, we've audited that um, in terms of our clinic, and we're not sure that we've actually hit 50% of under 21s, 21s and under, uh, currently on that. Um, but when you go into the clinic and ask about uh, access to that, um, you either get a positive uh, response. Um, so are they type 1 diabetic? Um, are they less than 20 and 365 days? Um, are they uh, m using um, uh, multiple daily insulin or pumps? And are they uh, required to use uh, multiple um, testing? Um, or are they uh, have been, admit, been admitted with a severe uh, hypoglycemic episode or a DKA, uh, and that they're not pregnant? Um, so, um, if those are passed, then it's just an automatic that will come back 
uh, within a day or two as, 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 uh, as being accepted and no questions asked. Um, clearly, there's a whole group of people outside of that range and that's where you start putting in exceptional uh, circumstances. List of exceptional circumstances? There isn't one. <laughs> yes, it's the computer says no, the computer says yes, it's the flip of a coin. I don't think that's really an acceptable position to be sitting on. So whether you're going to restrict that to a particular group or not, whether you're going to turn it down because there isn't the funds for it, if you're going to turn it down because you're going to require certain conditions in there, I think the least you, you, you uh, need is a reason why. And um, it's very much, I think we're getting to the point of whether the, this is up for review and what's going to happen, this does need to move on uh, in relation to this. So, if I was offering you this intervention, um, where patients come out saying every uh, diabetic should have it, uh, has made a huge difference to my life, uh, my husband's, uh, I didn't know uh, whether it would work for me, and after a week, uh, all that went away. What am I talking about? CGM. CGM. Lupin. No, not Lupin. Insulin. Uh, insulin, maybe. <laughs> oh, <Yeah. clears throat> Okay, so um, in terms of uh, structured education, so certainly in my practice, and I think this is um, the expectation is um, structured education of a high quality equivalent to Daphne has to be a starting point in terms of uh, any technology uh, uh, intervention. Um, uh, or, but certainly that's where we're at at the moment um, basically because uh, there isn't an intervention that reduces DKA by 61% there isn't an intervention that reduces severe hypoglycemia by 72% there isn't an intervention that has cost savings behind it um, so this is ingrained and certainly in the, the talks I was at at the Diabetes Technology Network is that Daphne uh, Oh, you've got my tweet. Yes. Indeed. So technology is getting. More, so this is where I got my my con, uh, continuous medical education on Twitter from from Don. So thank thank you very much in terms of that. So in terms of access, I suppose um, obviously we're talking to people who are who are patients who are actually quite empowered. So therefore, I think it's relatively easy for you to find out where the guidelines for type one and. Uh, uh, for type 1 for diabetes are available. There's a very good link on Grainne's uh, blog page yeah. in terms of that, because it's actually very hard actually to find it, but I'm, we're talking to people who are technically savvy, so you will find it elsewhere on the internet, but actually I, I know the quickest way to get it is through Grainne's website now. So you're the one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the only one, is it? Um, and I suppose two things to say, one thing to say about this, this is what a guideline. So essentially what you're uh, entitled to in your in this uh, in Ireland is laid out in this document or what you should expect. Um, I think there's a long list of there and they can be up for debate. But I think this isn't the the highest bar that you have to achieve. I think you should be considering of this: Do I hit any of these? And if I don't, well, does this is a guideline? So can my clinic take me anywhere beyond that? So I think these are useful in terms of directing people who really should be first on the list in terms of getting access to uh, continuous glucose monitors. It's not that different for pump technology as well. Um, but ultimately, anybody who can get use out of technology should be, um, uh, should be put forward for it. And um, I think there is a lower, lower threshold in terms of that um, more the, the number of uh, pumps within clinics, certainly it's increasing rapidly within our service. Continuous glucose monitors, Dexcoms, are increasing rapidly within our clinics as such. And the, the letters that we have to write to uh, access that is uh, none have been rejected. While you go on the flip the wheel of the Freestyle Libra and it's a yes or no um, uh, flip of the coin uh, decision. So uh, I haven't had any, had any rejections with regards to that. Now that's the area that I'm, so that's the, around the Dublin area and that may feed into Kate's uh, data in terms of potentiating the problem there um, and such. So how do we increase access? 
Um, an interesting story about uh, this gentleman um, is our health minister is that uh, he's been to our meeting where our health professionals in our area um, discuss diabetes. This is mainly GP and type 2 diabetes. But it was at the first one of these he, sa- uh, he, uh, he announced, I didn't know any about it, that the Freestyle Libre was coming. This was 15 months ago. So I said to him, can I tweet that? And his response was, go and tweet that. That'll shake them up in the HSE and get them, <laughs> get them going on it. So I suppose what that's demonstrated is these are obviously the, the decision makers and people within it, but it is quite a complicated system in trying to figure out how the system works and how to get something out of it. And um, three years of it, I needed a break from it. Sean's experiencing how to figure it out. Have you figured it out yet, Sean? No. So, uh, people, so as people who've um, had the, the, the good fortune to lead in the National Diabetes Programme, uh, we, can, we can design what we think that, that should be happening and hand it to the, the, to the HSC. But how we get them to actually implement that is, is fraught with problems. So I think the last thing I was asked to, to cover by uh, Shane was, I suppose, the general approach to the team in terms of how to um, get more out of them or how to um, the interaction with it. Because clearly um, there's been communication going on. It happens in the consultation room. It happens with our, when you're having one-to-one with your nurse or dietitian. Um, and I suppose we, we haven't spent that long talking to what's happening out in the waiting room and we haven't been involved in the communication that's happening out in the wider community. And I think that's something that's, that has to change and is changing in terms of healthcare professionals. Um, and, but clearly the reason the, the, the uh, thing that is changing is that the doctor or the team is no longer the expert and certainly in this area uh, we have to listen to what's available to us. So um, if you're coming in with technology to your team and the team is saying, I know nothing about that, well, I think it's, it's for them to sort of sit down and ask, um, well, give me 10 minutes of, of what you can tell me about it and bring me up to date with it. And I think getting involved and engaged with the team in that way uh, is, is one approach I would suggest in terms of trying to um, get the most out of your team. Uh, discussing with my colleagues, I suppose the issue is that um, when patients are coming into us, um, I suppose this is around the area of a patient coming in thinking that they've heard uh, on the internet that this, this system, it works perfectly um, and that's what I need and everything will be fine in terms of that. And the question is, has the, have they thought about what that is? And when the healthcare professional asks that, that's not necessarily uh, no to that. The question is, what do you understand about that? And tell me what you understand about that. Because I suppose... The, 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 the teams you work with um, uh, are, are involved with um, your team um, essentially they, what they want is the whole picture of where uh, you are and they don't necessarily need all the detail um, of what you're doing you don't necessarily need to share things you don't want to uh, share with them but they can't really work on, a, on one piece of the jigsaw of what's happening in your life uh, with your diabetes um, and um, as any parent will know, if you kept getting asked and asked again, people will eventually say yes, and that's what I do. I certainly do it to my kids. I certainly do it for my patients. <laughs> um, and um, I suppose I realise that I put team in here, and traditionally team has been the diabetes team, and where has been the patient in that? And clearly, the team dynamic has changed because the patient is now the change is the patient is becoming part of the, uh, the team in terms of equally making decisions and things like that and therefore like anybody playing on a team sport in terms of everybody uh, needs to be involved in that to get the, to get the best outcomes so uh, I'm not quite sure I didn't keep quite time there but I'll be finishing up uh, there so the only disclo- um, I'm supposed to put up a disclosure at the start um, and um, uh, but if you want whatever company has, has brought me to a conference at some stage or brought me for a dinner somewhere and things like that. Those sort of things are available on the internet. Uh, the only... <laughs> but I did... Um, there is an, an open disclosure um, website for, uh, for, uh, for, for the pharmaceutical industry uh, where our names can be listed on it. But the disclosure I thought I should give is obviously that... Um, uh, is the, the personal one and the one, and the one about, relation, uh, about where diabetes is. So I was asked, was I t- a T1? No, I'm not a T1. Um, but um, two years ago, yeah, my daughter was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. So I've completed 
23 years with, diabe- or with uh, being a diabetologist and two years ago my 18 year old daughter she's an adult so I asked her could I put, could I, uh, put this up here I'm not sure what that changed in terms of being a doctor. I don't think I'm going to be a different doctor for it. Um, I don't think I'm going to be a different parent for it. Um, I think um, in terms of um, her having diabetes, that is, yeah, very hard. And that uh, um, uh, is something she has to grow through and and work with and is doing very well uh, with that. So well, she's, she, she turned down a ticket for here to go to a concert. Uh, she's off at the festival down in Westmead somewhere. So uh, with that, um, I'll probably finish up there. Okay. Thank you.